please introduce yourself and your involvement in IoT. Hi, Bruce. Uh, I'm Paul Dant. I'm the Chief Strategist and Managing Principal for Independent Security Evaluators. We are uh, primarily a security services company. We're focused on uh, white box security assessments, um, primarily product security okay. assessments. Um, I've been in the, the hacking business, if you will, for over 20 years, so uh, I share the sentiment at ISE that, in general, your security is only as good as your weakest link. So in that vein, uh, a lot of the security product assessments that we undertake at ISE are primarily driven by a single vendor looking at their supply chain and their production chain, if you will, okay. uh, productivity chain, and trying to understand the security implications that are present at each of those integration points. Okay. So primarily, is it on a cons is it a consumer is it a consumer IoT um, focus for 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 your your organization? So we actually target enterprise enterprise, um, but because of our focus on lifecycle chain workflow those types of things, yeah. we tend to encounter a number of products that both touch the consumer and also fall into the consumer IoT device. Okay. Uh, ecosystem, if you will. Okay, so now are you saying when you say you focus on enterprise, is it the enterprise that's producing the IoT product or using the IoT product? We are hoping both. Uh, okay. Today it's really more about using the product. So okay. uh, one of our primary industries right now mm. at ISC is the media and entertainment industry. So mm. working with a number of the Hollywood studios yeah. and helping them to protect their, their critical digital media assets. Okay. So what really happens in that overall supply chain and, and production chain is that you have what used to really be about uh, physical transport of a single reel of film representing a digital media, or mm. I'm sorry, uh, an analog media right, asset at right, that point, right. uh, to and from locations that are involved in the production process. Today, we tend to see internet-based file transfer systems that create a brand new copy of a digital media right, asset. Right. So now, every single movie theater, practically. Absolutely, right? uh, movie theaters and anywhere else. Even before sure. then, uh, we're talking about you know large providers like Deluxe and Technicolor, mm. all the way down to mm. two or three man uh, garage-based operations mm. that are providing mm. translation localization services for distribution. Okay. At that point, because you're making a, an actual copy of a digital media asset, the security of those individual locations, as well as the software, the applications, the appliances that that data appears on, it's all critical to mm. that single vendor. Mm. Okay. So you obviously have a lot of experience in, a, in security in general. Let's shift it to IoT security now. Sure. All right. So where do you think where do you think IoT security is today, anyway? So you you make an interesting point. Um, my experience in security, I think. Uh, allows me to see, maybe a bit more uh, perceptively than others, that IoT security, while I believe the risks are in many ways greater, uh, when we're talking about especially consumer level mm. IoT security mm. devices, the risks to security and especially privacy of the consumers mm -hmm. is, is much greater. Mm. But the security implications are largely the same. Right. Uh, so I, I think in general, you know, the, the security work that I do, uh, in understanding how systems work, how systems take input, process it, provide output, right. how uh, these systems store their data, it's all very much relevant to IoT both in the enterprise and at the uh, the consumer level. Yeah, no, and I would definitely agree because you know when you talk about an IoT product, you're really talking about an IoT system. Yes. And when you're talking about an IoT system, you're having to worry about not just um, network security, mobile security, web mm -hmm. security, Absolutely. Right, app security, and so it really is a complex system, and right. and then you have to kind of worry about system security as, as well. Is that your experience? Absolutely. Um, so one of one of the uh, primary elements that we find in most of the assessments that we perform, and our assessments typically, uh, you know, whatever the context is, a, a product in some type of a production chain or, or workflow. Um, we tend to look first at design okay. and understanding first if there was security considered during the design of that product. Uh, if so, um, if not, obviously we note it, but if so, we look at how thorough that design uh, really was. You know, okay. Does it adhere to standard security principles that we would expect to see in any system that's, mm. that's handling mm. sensitive data? Right. Um, so the principle of least privilege, as an example, what we're finding okay. in 
IoT is that um, while a lot of these devices may be very revolutionary in the fun functionality they provide in yeah. the IoT space, right. um, not to pick on any particular vendor, but we'll just, uh, as an example, throw out Fitbit. So Fitbit is an interesting one in that it does a couple of things. Um, it follows us around as human beings. So there's a lot of data being gathered in using that device. It's also communicating on the RF spectrum via Bluetooth right. with right. one phone, maybe multiple phones, maybe your computer at home, maybe the computer at work. Okay. So we have some of these devices that essentially serve as gateways between the RF spectrum and the IP based right. spectrum. Right. Um, so that alone is, is interesting and really speaks to a need for... Lots of attack surfaces. E exactly, that's exactly right. Um, so when we talk about design principles like least privilege, let's, um, let's take as, a, as an example um, you know, any sort of a device that might be using uh, a Linux-based operating system, okay. which many IoT devices are Do, using today. Sure. Yeah. We understand to an extent in the enterprise that that particular device manufacturer may not be an expert in data security and internet security. And in the enterprise, we're learning to not accept that and to insist on more, whether it's mm. through that manufacturer or through a third party. Mm. As consumers, we're still at that level of misunderstanding where we expect a reasonable level of security afforded by the vendor or manufacturer yeah. in using that device. Right. Um, obviously, that, that trust is misplaced today. Um, Misplaced may not be the right word, but um, no, you know. I the, think it's not a bad word. It's not a bad word. Um, so when we talk about any of those devices where we we assume a certain level of security and privacy, and then we get down to the technical aspects at the design level, where mm. you know it's operating on on a, a Linux-based system. If we're not adhering to security principles, I've mentioned least privilege a couple of times, and, yes. and I, I mention it because it's one that we've noticed. In implementation, we find vulnerabilities that would ordinarily not be that big of a deal, but because it results in, uh, let's say, command injection um, through SQL injection or cross-site scripting, which are all prevalent, mm. again, tying back to the idea mm. that security is security, right. even in IoT. Right. But uh, in those cases, when we're able to inject commands, we find that because they did not adhere to the principle of, of least privilege, mm the context under which those command injection are operating on are typically root or the equivalent on that device. That, Kinda you know, scary. It, exactly. And it takes what would normally be an, an iffy vulnerability right. to a very critical vulnerability, especially when you then add in the remote aspect to it, where right. some of these devices are actually internet facing. Okay. Well, so what would, what would you, you say are the top five issues today in, in IoT security? Top five. Um, so design is definitely the first one. Design, um, security solid by design, design, is that what you mean? Yes, so adhering to, to specific security principles as well as just taking security into consideration at design time. So our recommendation in many cases is um, whether you're talking about a single product or uh, a number of interconnected products that make up a bigger system, mm. um, performing a threat model, you know, a, a collaborative threat model, yeah. potentially right. uh, optimally across multiple teams, multiple types of resources and skill sets to get everybody's input. Yeah. That's the time to start thinking like the bad guy and start thinking about the really wild, crazy extremes under which your product could fail. Hence the, the need for multiple perspectives and yeah. very diverse outlooks. Okay. So um, that's definitely the top one. And All I right. think that a lot of the, the issues that we see in implementation would be less problematic had proper security design be, been in place at the beginning. Okay, that's number uh, one. That's number one. So number two, I would say, is web security. So many of these devices operate with lightweight web servers. Um, then the component that we tend to forget about a lot as mm. consumers is that cloud-based service. That's right. That's collecting all the data from the device that we're using. Mm. And that one might actually worry me more because of the mm. fact that it is cloud-based. These systems are typically in an effort to save costs utilize you know, AWS and other platforms out there like this, the, the vendors are typically going for you know, a secure multi-tenant uh, data, right. data storage solution right. where right. physically the data between consumers, between users is commingled, but logically it's separated. Um, not typically crypto cryptographically separated. I'll, I'll also add it's usually based mm -hmm. on an integer or a GUID ID that okay. differentiates between entities. Um, so along those lines, um, when you're talking about any of those web interfaces, we're still seeing, um, I think, 
a very even mix between legacy systems and yeah. legacy understanding of these systems. Okay. Um, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, cross-site Again. request forgery, mm. all of these things that we learned about when Web 2.0 first came about, we're still seeing them yeah. in, in these IoT devices as well as the cloud storage side. And that, uh, I'm and sorry, do you cloud consider those two side. different things, the, the web, web security and cloud security, would you consider that two separate things or? Uh, in one vein, I would consider them the same, but in another vein, I'd consider them different. I would mm -hmm. say as it, as it pertains specifically to web security, it's the same. You know, if, if you have, whether the back end is, is tr uh, attempting to achieve a secure multi-tenancy or it's a single internet presence, um, you know, you still have your same web security challenges, okay. session management, authentication, right. um, and then of course all of those validation, the input and output uh, stuff that leads to SQL injection and, and cross-site scripting, all of those things, um, you know, we know about them. There are frameworks out there sure. that specifically address them, but exactly. for some reason, and I think this, this really speaks to uh, the first issue, design, as well as just an overall lack of awareness, you know, we still see these issues pop up. Right. Um, so the third one, after, after web three. security is um, cryptography. I, I think that there is a very, very se severe, excuse me, severe gap in understanding of even basic cryptography uh, principles. So, okay. uh, you know, when I talk with uh, vendors, manufacturers of these devices, and we get into that, you know, I wouldn't even say a deep level of technical discussion, but moderately, um, and you're talking, you're talking about encryption when you say cryptography? Encryption, yes. Okay. So, um, you know, basic cryptographic principles, um, hashing versus encryption, as an example, I, I find that there's not a lot of understanding of even the difference between those two basic concepts. Mm. And mm. the net result of that is when you don't understand the difference between those two and you make the wrong decision when you're, say, storing passwords of users, suddenly you introduce massive risk mm. in the event that either your authentication mechanism is flawed, uh, the form in which you're collecting the information for authentication is flawed through SQL injection or cross-site right, scripting. Right. Any one of those things can le then lead to complete data compromise. And if you're, uh, let's say, you chose to encrypt your passwords as opposed to hashing them, mm. which in most cases is going to be the wrong decision, your users' passwords at a massive level are now vulnerable to you know, brute force cryptanalysis, basically well, I, meaning I think own. a lot of our viewers are probably asking themselves, what is the difference between ha you know, hashing and, in, and encryption? Can you just tell sure. us quickly? A absolutely. Um, so the primary difference is that, that hashing a, uh, a set of data produces a fixed length value mm -hmm. that is irreversible. In other words, the, the output hash value can never be reversed back to the original data. Okay. If it can, then it's a broken hash algorithm. Okay. Okay. So in that usage, it's best to store your password in, in a hashed format that's non-reversible, right. because then you can just apply the same hash to the user-provided password, compare the two. Right. If they're the same, you're reasonably right. certain it's the same password. Right. Right. Encryption, on the other hand, is uh, utilization, utilizing a combination of an algorithm and some type of a secret, whether that's shared or, or otherwise, mm. uh, such that the data is private to most people unless they have Got it. the same algorithm yeah. and that key. Got it. So that's the primary difference. In many cases, encryption is necessary because you need to reverse the data. But in the case of mm. something like a password, mm. <laughs> making a decision yeah. right to go with encryption yeah. would be right. the wrong one. Right, right. Number four. So I think uh, problem number four primarily revolves around um, the a combination, the, the lack of understanding mm -hmm. uh, at the top of an organization down. So what we typically tend to find is that your security culture, your awareness, your mentality mm. is really only as sound as what the top level is saying down to interesting, you. Interesting, interesting. So um, that, that really resonates in a number of ways. First, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, going back to number one, the design yeah. principles, relying upon uh, common criteria, FIPS, ISO, any one of those compliance standards, or regulating yeah. standards, um, it's, it's really a fatal flaw when your true objective is security. Um, it's a fantastic way to organize. It's a fantastic way to plan for security initiatives. But in terms of understanding your overall security posture, mm, mm. it tends to be uh, a false profit in some senses. Okay. And when the top communicates downward that 
we are HIPAA compliant or HIPAA certified, right, right. there tends to be um, an immediate relaxation. I was going to say a bit of a laziness culture. there. Then. Absolutely. Um, and so that's when you start to see data being mishandled mm. from uh, mm. end customer or yeah. end service, uh, uh, service consumer data all the way to um, you know, IT operations where we're right. creating new accounts and right. creating passwords and those types of things. Okay, yeah, um, good point. So that I, I think that's a, a significant problem and it, it's especially relevant to IoT because when you have that, that level of, of lax security awareness and you're not really thinking about how am I handling the data on my company provided system, right. you think even less about the devices that you're bringing into the workplace. You're thinking even less about what are the, the, the ramifications of me synchronizing my Fitbit yep. with my work computer. It's very convenient. And that really brings me to, to number, number five. five. Um, and, and I think that in terms of IoT, this is really, it's se severely important for consumers. Um, for enterprises, there's, there's a recognition of security problems. Mm. Now it's a matter of you know, making that call to action. But um, understanding the overall risks that are uh, involved in utilizing these devices and actually demanding more being done okay. for it. Uh, okay. So as a, as a consumer, for example. So you're saying you know, the onus is on the consumer here. In many ways, mm. um, especially when we're talking about devices that you know can be bought at Best Buy or on Amazon.com, um, obviously, we're not fully thinking about the privacy and security ramifications of those decisions if we go into them essentially uninformed. Yeah, um, and it, don't we think that because they're there, that that they've taken care of that level of security that, for us? That's exactly right, and you know, it's it's arguable as a consumer. Is that reasonable? Part of me says yes. I don't know. Uh, but you know, part of me says, well, whether that's reasonable or not, it's moot because right. the security of these devices is lacking. And so, if we're not going to do something about it, either not use the devices mm. or, uh, you or know, petition Best Buy as an example. Absolutely. Now, it, and and I think that really speaks to you know just a larger industry issue, and that's that's a matter of cost. Yeah. So I've sat down with um, some interesting individuals throughout um, a number of, of verticals that are in some ways touching into IoT. So, uh, you know, as an example, home automation. I mean, we're seeing sure. devices now that are branching into home, home automation to the level of uh, remote, uh, the remote ability to control the hot and cold water mix in, in your shower heads and actually be able to remotely see <laughs> aggregate data speaking to the usage of hot versus cold water distribution. Um, so I've had a chance to sit down with some of the individuals that are mm -hmm. actually responsible for building these up and uh, you know, designing these systems. And that's one of their, their primary challenges is who pays for that extra dollar or dollar fifty per unit in better securing the device. So as consumers, I think that while we don't have the answer for that, we need to address the vendors and manufacturers to find out where that cost should go or, or how it can be distributed. Excellent advice. Thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you.